live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's the Science Cafe. All right, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out. I hope you guys are having a good week, a good Thursday. I'm Carrie, clearly not Katie or Chris. Um, I'm filling in tonight. Katie's in China visiting her grandson, and Chris is out of town, so you get me. So I'm here tonight to uh, introduce our very special guest speakers. Um, so we have got Dr. Adrian Smith. He's the head of our Evolutionary Biology and Behavior Research Lab here at the museum. And Gabriel Duggar is uh, an artist who has worked with him on an art and science collaboration in the lab here at the museum. And I'm going to step over here for one second because I forgot my clicker. <laughs> and we're going to go ahead and start with a video um, that's going to give a little bit of an introduction. And here we go. I think the thing that was really interesting for me that I didn't see coming was also being informed by the ants and seeing how the ants labor, you know, the work that they're doing and thinking about um, the scale of work that they're doing and the repetition in their work and how that relates to my work founded in fibers. I'm Gabriel Duggan, I'm an artist. I'm Adrian Smith, I'm a biologist and we're here to talk about art and science collaboration and specifically the piece that we collaborated on in my lab at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences dealing with ant nest architecture right. and the processes of art and science, really. So you went out in the field with, with us to, to make the cast of the right. ant nest that's, that's incorporated in your piece. That's one of the coolest parts of doing research, my sort of research, is that like we can go out into a forest, like pour a bunch of dental plaster down a <laughs> hole that's like this size, right? And then we come out with like this crazy complex like structure right. that these animals have built that it was completely outside of our view before that. It's pretty hard labor to excavate this nest mm -hmm. and to go out there, find the nest, and then set everything up. That's stuff that you would never see in that piece yeah. that's upstairs. So right. that's something that's that I relate to the ants with is labor. Mm -hmm. And labor plays into fiber work specifically a lot and, and also people's perceptions of, of art as a whole. People are always impressed by more labor. You constructed the piece in the lab the experiments that I've that I've done in the lab while you've been there is basically shown that whatever hypothesis I thought might be working probably isn't working. Right. And so that sort of stuff is is process research for me in that it might not even end up in the final product in the, you know, scientific paper that I write. Yes, there's a lot of invisible work. I've been I've been thinking about invisible work a lot in that um, so much time put into all the work around the work, all the work that supports the capital W work. The stuff that I'm doing, the, the piece that we have in the lab right now, technically the textile method that's involved is crochet. Even though it's, it's using a crochet stitch to make this weird web effect, um, I absolutely couldn't do it without being a weaver, which is a completely different process and has a lot of like prep work going into it. And so it's my knowledge of having that prep work as a weaver is the thing that lets me work with tension like this on the fly. But you don't see that. You would never think weaver, you, I'm not weaving. But that knowledge and years of experience with weaving is now showing up and being there for me. Well, it was awesome to have you in the lab. It's exciting to have something to show after that and that will live on, at least for a little bit in the lab. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, well, thanks for coming to our science cafe tonight. Um, do you have the clicker, Carrie? Thanks. Um, this is going to be a little bit different of a science cafe. It's uh, with me, I'm a scientist, and then Gabrielle, she's an artist, as you saw in the, in the video. And we're going to be talking about our work in collaboration that we did this summer and extended uh, throughout this fall and into uh, the winter. Um, and we're gonna it, we're gonna focus it on both of our work and and then around this piece that you saw in the video. And we're gonna cut this uh, science cafe off at eight, and you're welcome to leave then, or you can have a special behind the scenes tour of my lab 
up on the third floor where the art piece is actually installed and on display uh, right now. So we'll, we'll do this short presentation, I'll do a short presentation, Gabriel will come up and do a short presentation, then we'll come up together and talk about it. We'll have a short discussion with you guys and then uh, we will invite everybody who wants to up to the third floor until 8.30, from about 8 to 8.30. Uh, we'll hang out up there. You can check out the piece, uh, check out some cool ant stuff. Uh, Magda, postdoc in my lab, has some uh, educational ant uh, stuff that uh, you're welcome to take uh, and look at and, and use, and it'll be a good time. Okay, so uh, as Carrie said, I work here at the museum. I run a research lab, the Evolutionary Biology and Behavior Research Lab, on the third floor, one of the glass walled labs next to the dinosaurs. Um, and I work on things that are way smaller than dinosaurs, ants. Um, so this on the left is a picture of me, uh, 19 years old in Florida, in Tallahassee, Florida. And I'm about six foot four, uh, six foot four inches tall. I'm standing up at the bottom of a pit, and that pit was dug so I could collect a whole colony of harvester ants. So this uh, harvester ant that's native to Florida. And you see on the right, the guy who um, I worked for as an undergrad, Professor Walter Schinkel at Florida State University, standing next to one of the first nest casts that he made, actually. Um, he pioneered uh, the field of nest architecture and nest casting in ants. And here you see, made out of dental plaster, a cast of an entire colony of a harvester ant, uh, the same species that I was digging out out of the ground. And so what you see there are uh, impressions of what the architecture underground and in the soil would actually look like. The top of that is the, the surface of the soil. So all the ants will go in there. It's about eight feet deep for an average full-size colony of this ant. It's pretty, pretty incredible. So the, the art collaboration focused on this idea of nest architecture in ants because it's a really cool thing. Um, one of the coolest aspects of, of ant biology that I work on and one of the active projects happening in my lab. So nest architecture is scientifically interesting uh, for a lot of reasons, and I'm interested in it for several reasons. Um, and the main reasons why people are, study nest architecture in ants is because you can think of the nest of an ant and the architecture of that, of that nest as a phenotype, as an actual um, feature of that particular species, an extension of, of the animal's body in, in some cases. <clears throat> and it's a product of natural selection. So that means um, that it is shaped uh, through evolutionary history of the species to be functional and be have sort of adaptive structures. So it actually accomplishes something for the particular species. And this usually translates into nest architecture being species specific. Every species of ant has its own particular architecture that it constructs to live in. Um, the third point here about nest architecture is that it's self-organized in its construction, right? There's no, um, there's no behavioral cast of a head architect ant, right? There's no universal um, uh, blueprints that they all follow. It's all built by local interactions, by the ants interacting with themselves and interacting with other ants and what they've done to, this, to the soil in which they're digging, right? So it's a really cool way of of, of an emergent phenomenon of this complex architecture just emerging from local level interactions of individuals interacting with each other and also interacting with the soil. Um, here's how one of the main w sort of tools that we use to study nest architecture. So we'll actually go and make casts of the, of the, of the uh, underground cavities that these ants have cleared out. There's a couple different ways that, that we've done this and that Walter Schinkel's pioneered at Florida State. Uh, one of them you saw earlier in plaster, so that was a dental plaster that we'll just pour into the ground, make a slurry, pour it into the ground, wait for it to dry and harden, then, then pick it out of the ground. It comes out in many pieces when we do that. The other way is uh, a little bit uh, cooler, but a lot more dangerous. It's actually taking out a portable kiln and melting metal in the field, and then taking that liquid molten metal um, sometimes it's zinc, sometimes it's aluminum, sometimes it's an amalgamation of the both, and pouring that liquid metal uh, that we've heated up way past its melting point to where it's almost um, igniting, and pouring that into the ground, and then it flows uh, as far as it'll go until it cools and hardens. And then usually you can get a whole cast out that way. You can get uh, up to probably four or five feet of nests um, frozen in metal out of the ground in one piece. Uh, you can see some of those if you come up to the lab. Uh, afterwards. And here's what that process looks like. So basically 10 minutes after pouring, you can start digging a pit around it, and then what you uncover is in the, in the soil matrix, you see uh, the filled cavities of the, of the ant nest that the ants is actually ma made and constructed to live in. Uh, this is one of the casts you can see upstairs. 
Um, I mentioned that architecture is species specific. So every, every instance of architecture you've seen before this slide is all been the, the harvest rant, the eastern harvest rant. Um, these are, are nest architectures from a group of ants called leaf cutting ants or fungus gardening ants. So they will actually dig underground nests, subterranean nests, and instead of having these oblong sort of lobed chambers off of them, they'll have these big uh, egg to watermelon size uh, circular chambers in there, and those are filled with fungus. So they're actually growing a fungu fungal cult cultivar underground that they'll actually uh, groom and feed to their young and, and get their own substance out of that, l that living culture that they actually garden. So here you see a species that we have in North Carolina on the left, uh, Trachea myrmex septentrionalis is a species name. And then uh, in, in the more uh, central and South America, I think this picture is probably from Argentina, uh, you see a giant leaf cutter ant nest. And inside of that, that leaf cutter nest might be up to one to three million ants might live in that. Uh, I, I doubt that they even got this out of the ground. They just sort of cast it uh, probably with a cement truck and then had a crew uh, dig and uncover the underground architecture. So really, really cool, but species specific. Architecture is also not static in ants, so it grows. So here you see the nest architecture of the um, eastern harvester ant in a series of casts as the colony grows. So it starts out from a single, a single tunnel with some chambers and then uh, grows to be multiple uh, tunnels and shafts uh, with multiple chambers. So here you see an incipient, a new, uh, basically a year or two old uh, colony on the left, and all the way on the right, this might be a five to 10 year old colony, a mature colony of that species. So the architecture is adaptive and it grows uh, as the colony grows. When Gabriel was in the lab uh, doing the art installation and we were collaborating, I was doing a project based on this. This is one of Walter's experiments where he would dig a giant pit and fill that pit in with different uh, color sand, layer by layer, and then plant a colony in it and see how they constructed and moved sand when they, when they constructed the nest. And what he found was that instead of an ant uh, being six feet underground, taking a bite of soil, taking a clump of soil, and then walking six feet up and throwing that outside, it's instead, it's sort of a bucket brigade, and some of those buckets don't end up outside. They ended up plastered in the walls and ceilings and floors of the nest. You can see that when you go uh, and dig up one of these uh, layer cake colonies. You'll see different color soils uh, plastered in the walls and ceilings and tunnels and different layers in the nest. So we can actually visualize this, and I was visualizing this in the lab. Here's a time lapse of these harvest ants digging over 24 hours, just in a, in a little sandwich of plexiglass. There's 300 ants here. This is sped up. It's going to show you about 20 hours and 30 seconds. You can see the process of them digging. Uh, they're digging it. There's a tube on the left that goes out to an arena where they're dumping most of the soil. And the really cool part of it is, is you can see that that bucket brigade happen, and you can see the deposition of soil and not just the excavation. You can see here, if you look in that little circle on the, on the left side of the screen towards the middle, and you watch the edges of that, instead of shrinking, and it's actually growing. It's a point of deposition. So they're not excavating, they're excavating, but some of that excavated soil gets plastered into the walls of even this artificial lab nest. So that was one of the, one of the things I was working on in the lab uh, one of the active areas of experimentation that was happening when Gabriel was in the lab uh, doing the, the um, art piece. So um, I, I was really interested in collaborating with an artist to work on a collaborative project uh, with nest architecture because nest architecture for me as a person who studies ants is, is the one area of, of my professional expertise that often gets labeled as art. Um, so there's a, there's a tradition of, of of making these uh, casts of an ant nest and then either selling it or, or putting it on the internet as, an accept, as sort of a, an art piece, but just one that's sort of a, a natural product that's admired for its aesthetics. So what I was interested in is working with an artist and bringing it beyond aesthetics and, and working with nest architecture and seeing what uh, an artist might do with it as, as part of a grounds for making an art installation. Okay, with that, I'm going to stop my, my part and hand the make, mic over to Gabrielle. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, so this is quite a different scene. Uh, this is a model of some of my work. I do have a fashion background and textile background, and that is what um, informs all of my work technically, and then I kind of build from there. So this is, these are select 
looks from a collection that I did a few years ago. I actually presented it here in Raleigh. Um, I, the piece on the far right, I hand spun. So I'm doing everything from digital weaving, digital knitting, hand knitting, hand spinning, hand weaving, et cetera. I try to basically just get all those tools in my toolbox and then use them how I want to. Um, I still, of course, work with textiles and fiber work. I actually, um, I'm a visiting assistant professor at the University of North Texas, and primarily I'm teaching weaving. Uh, this was actually woven, this is a front and back view of a coverlet that I wove. It's 80 by 88 inches, um, cotton and wool, and it's taken after, <coughs> it's taken after traditional coverlet patterns, which you can kind of see in the center there, and then I have the rings surrounding it are taken from Lake Erie bathymetry, and then I've shrunken down the pattern by 10%. That's a scale that is not really accessible on a hand loom. So it's combining these traditional techniques and the digital, and this is a piece that I made just this year for a show that's actually closing this weekend at um, ECU, at the Great Gallery. So this is the first installation I did in a gallery, and this is m mostly what drives my work these days. Uh, I'm really interested in a lot of tension, movement, implied movement, um, and then you'll see there are different ways that I've been activating these pieces in space as well. And here you can see there are these sort of traditional cable knit techniques, but I'm really interested already, this is from 2011, I'm already interested in a lot of negative space, seeing how few stitches I can have to make a cloth, technically a cloth, or to let it hold together, or to um, basically control or conduct itself through space. Um, how much do I need to interact with that yarn or that thread for it to be a thing? And this is a larger piece that was a collaboration at the Southeastern Center for Contemporary Art in Winston-Salem. Uh, there are some video components on the far right and the bottom left, and uh, the collaboration was thinking about the meaning that garments have in our personal lives with four other artists. And this is a project for the Durham Storefront Project uh, over in Durham. I think this is a bank now. They activate a lot of unused spaces throughout the city. And so you can see here I'm bringing in, I'm not just working with yarn, but I've started bringing in these kind of remnants of society, these kind of garbage materials, and I'm starting to assemble them in a textile way, so working repetitively and with many little things. And here's a collaboration. So you'll see a couple collaborations in this show. Um, this is a collaboration with movement artist PJ Mask. And so there's something that happens when you have a body in the space. Um, even just as a viewer, we start feeling uh, vicariously, we kind of have the experience of the space, even if we can't enter the installation or the work, we can't pick it up and touch it, but seeing a model move through space with it, or watching a movement artist move in the space, helps us feel like we're inhabiting that and having that experience ourselves, even if we're just watching. And this is the first piece that I figured out that I should do this crochet thing, that it's technically crochet, but is chaotic. Um, these two bottom wing pieces are balcony railings that I took from outside. Uh, this is at Governor's Island Art Fair. It's a bunch of old buildings in New York. And here I have a handful of different techniques. I have that, cha that chaotic crochet, these knitting machine pieces, and then just almost like a warp preparation that you would do for weaving. Um, which are all those straight lines. And what I like is that we're losing the foreground and the background. They kind of shape shift and push back and forth. It's hard to tell what's in the front here physically. <coughs> this is another piece I did at Governor's Island later, a year later. And there are many, many, many little strings. So I think that I keep having a habit of making invisible work. Um, <laughs> I think that my, I've been thinking about this lately too, is, is the work about the piece itself, or is, it, is the piece really just evidence of what I've done with the material throughout time, throughout the time given in the space? So these have these tiny little shards of glass that are stuck on the edge of this branch, and the branch is balanced on two rocks, and the shards are stuck on with roofing tar, and then there are these other little shards that are hovering above each of those spine 
shards. Um, and they're like plotted in space. They're just kind of hovering from different points. Um, some of you might have seen this. This is at Contemporary Art Museum here in Raleigh um, a year or two ago. This was an interactive exhibition where people could come, were invited into the installation, and I handed them a thread with a verbal prompt, and then they could take it and they were built on the installation as well. I also did, um, and I'm not showing it, I did a project with some middle schoolers in front of CAM in 2013 during the summer. Um, and then this is another collaboration. I don't have great photos of it here, but I have some good video. It's, this is a performance I did with Nick Jenkins where we connected contact microphones to one of my installations for the Indie Grits Film Festival in South Carolina. And um, we plucked it and basically turned it into an instrument. This is something that I wanna keep exploring. This is a public art piece I did in Atlanta. It's art on the Beltline Atlanta. So I was tying, this is all like outdoor materials that stayed out for a couple months. And then I also translate these things into basic recti rectangle format, which is what we're all a lot more accustomed to with painting. Um, it's something that I can ship, and if I want to, I could sell, or somebody could keep it if they want to, or is everything else that I've been showing you is temporary. Um, this is an installation that I also want to continue exploring. This was from last year up in New York, and I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here. This one has magnets, and this is something that Rob Dunn was especially interested in when we got to talking about my work. Uh, so there's a magnet there that is hovering and it's trying to connect to the welded metal, and of course it cannot. Um, and that line at the bottom that's vertical, that's the true gravity. So there are these tiny little dots floating throughout the piece, and those are magnets. And this piece was uh, leading up to the election, and I was thinking about all the tension that was building up and how people are not really speaking the same language even though there's plenty of arguing. So it's called with and without. So thinking about how either you're in the group or you're without, which doesn't line up grammatically, it means you're lacking. So um, thinking about that and how it's just tense. So we have these rigid forms that I've welded and hand hammered in metal, and then the knit pieces throughout. And then that's it. So I wanna thank Rob Dunn and Susan Brandeis who connected me with the project too. All right, so now what we wanna do is, um, Gabriel and I have some prompts that uh, we prepared just to sort of talk about um, the, the things that were involved in this collaboration and to inspire the sort of the question and answer session with you guys and the discussion with you guys. Um, so I'll, I'll start by asking these to, to Gabriel. So what, what elements of your work contributed to the, the particular art piece that's in the lab uh, right now and the one that you see a, a section of on the screen here? Um, so I was building with tension and tensegrity. Tensegrity is something that Buckminster Fuller was really interested in. Um, so having lock, interlocking elements that hold each other together through the forces that actually are trying to pull them apart, such as gravity. Um, so that's what's happening with the crochet method that doesn't look like crochet. And I'm also really interested, again, in the negative space, which is something I, I feel like I could spend years exploring with with the ants specifically. Um, it's just, I think that n there's some secret thing that's happening with negative space and, and how they're building their nests. Yeah, and a cool part of this, which you'll see if you, if you come and look at it or look at it uh, next time you come visit the museum, is um, all the, it's a cast of a harvester ant nest and all the pieces actually fit together. Like it's, we could string them all together if we wanted. They're all contiguous. But um, when, when you were doing the piece, we chose to to, to sort of explode them. They're not connected in, th in the art piece itself. And I think that kind of says a lot um, for what's going on in the lab, because to view the piece, it's, it's kind of cool because you have to look through it, and you're looking through it at, at me typing on a computer and then getting sad that scientists just type on a computer all day <laughs> instead of playing with ants. Uh, but you're looking through it uh, to look at it, and um, you're not looking at an intact nest, even though it could be. Right, cool. right. It's it's fragmented, and yeah, it's a, it's like an exploded view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that that's just something I'm naturally drawn to, and I'm I'm not sure entirely what's all behind that for me as an artist. But that's 
the beauty of being an artist or a scientist is that you dedicate your life to following your questions. Um, so yeah, I'm really interested in these kind of exploded views, things that are just kind of floating in space and seem like they're paused in time. Um, and yeah, there's there's like a part particulation process that happens for the ants and then of course for me as a fiber artist working with many little things. Um, for me, the unifying role for fiber work is unifying different elements, disparate elements through tension, usually through tension and balance. So taking many little things, and sometimes that means breaking things up into many little things so that you can put them together in a different way again. Okay, let me ask you the next question. Uh, what do we want to convey with this piece? What, was, what do you think we were trying to say? Or were we trying to say anything? There's not a huge psychological or social commentary aspect to this piece. I, there really is a lot that could be said. Um, especially working side by side with the ants, it, it's just, it's such a, it's a whole other world in there. It, it's incredible. Um, I will say that the, the little pieces of the tubing, things that I was thinking about, the little pieces of the tubing, they can kind of act as that person for us. They can be almost like a model where we can imagine ourselves being that scale and moving through that space or the negative space or the nest. Um, so they're cut up latex medical tubing, which some of them look like pasta pieces. But um, they, again, I'm, I'm fragmenting them to bring them back together. That's just a process that I do. And um, I, I was mostly interested in the materials that are used in the lab that are meant to um, substitute the ant's nesting. So using dental plaster, pe petri dishes, latex medical tubing, it's, um, it's just not what their natural element is, and yet we, that's what we have to study them through. So thinking about how that lens is just, it's not the same, but it's the best we can do, and it's, it's something interesting in itself. Yeah. Um, I think a cool part of this is it's, it's an art piece in a science museum. Mm -hmm. Your pieces are in art galleries. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've never done anything in a science museum before, I'm guessing, right? <laughs> yeah, so um, how do you think, like, the the atmosphere plays into it or the context of the place? Uh, so if, I don't know if any of you have thought about just really fast picture an art gallery in your head and then picture a science museum in, there, in your head. They're both, they can both be very exciting places. But one tends to be a little bit more stimulating immediately. Um, the art spaces that we're used to these days are stark white. They're sterilized, basically, visually. They're just white spaces. And uh, the Science Museum, I love this Science Museum. And I spend a lot of time here on my own, just trying to hide and explore the world on my own. It's wonderful. Um, but it's exciting because there's a lot going on visually. <laughs> So installing, installing this piece in your lab that's behind glass, so we're in our own space that's a lab that's got its own world going on. And then right on the other side of the glass is just a rave that's exploded. It's just lots of different colors of lights um, side by side with fossils. It's just, it's so stimulating. And it, it, can, it can be distracting to see what my forms are up close. Uh, so it, it helped when we, we got to put a backdrop behind it. Yeah. Um, I think this gets into the next question that we had is, uh, is your mic running out of gas? No, I think we're good. OK. Um, what commonalities do we find in the artistic and scientific processes? Uh, just in the collaboration of you being in the lab and, and us doing this in this particular place and then talking about what it means to be an artist, what it means to be a scientist. I mean, were there things that you saw uh, in that? I know I have some answers. I was going to say, if you want to start off on this one. Yeah, well, I, I think it's really interesting to have an artist in a science laboratory. Um, if you go back to like Renaissance times, there was no differentiation between the two professions. Um, and I think there's some core goals that are, that are shared between art and science. Um, for me, as a, like I feel like my, my core goal is to have a particularly weird interest uh, into something that's no one else has a particular interest into, and then try to figure out something and see something no one's seen before and convey that to people, uh, whether or not that's publishing a scientific paper for other scientists to, to read, or whether or not it's building a museum exhibit to tell people about this cool thing that, that maybe no one's noticed or, or 
or, or seen before. And then, and then sort of building the story of value about why it's important to know these things and, and figure out these things as a human pursuit. And I feel like a lot of that has, has transferred over into um, what it might mean to be an artist, what it might mean to make an art piece, because no, I don't think there's anybody else in the world that, that would have or could have made uh, what you make as an artist. And in some instances, I don't think there's anybody else who would study w exactly what I'm studying and trying to figure out exactly what I'm what I'm doing. So I know having her in the having Gabrielle in the lab um, kind of kind of cemented that idea for me a little bit. I don't know if you share that impression or not. Yeah, I, I think that doors just keep opening. I, I really feel like there's so much more that I wish I could do. Um, just even you know, what we learned with the ants, uh, me seeing what's what's happening on the surfaces of their face, that's a whole world in itself that is completely not understood. Um, but yeah, being being a specialist, I guess, yeah, is what you're talking about. Um, yeah, it's not, it's like going back to Jackson Pollock, it's not a question of could you do that or who else could do that. It's not, it's not just about skill, although skill is still a big part of this. It's about did you do it? You know, and why did you do it? And so, for for artists, you know, we deal with a lot more philosophical questions, um, but questions, which is something that's really critical to science um, practices. So, I was thinking about it earlier today that our jobs as artists for the last century really have been to um, to push and and look for the unknowable and just keep finding things that we just don't we don't understand and scientists are they're trying to find answers but they're also finding more questions too so we're all kind of chasing off into like this infinity of questions mm -hmm. yeah 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 um and the other thing that i noticed and i mentioned it a little bit in the video when i talked about invisible work um Adrian does a lot of video editing. i have to do a lot of photo editing we have to do a lot of documentation of our work um you have to, we, we have to basically give, supply the public with the proof of what we've done. Um, we have to justify it through writing and through reading and making these other connections as academics. Um, and uh, we also have to do a lot of translating, especially with art and science collaborations, weird collaborations that are interdisciplinary. There's a lot of translation that goes on. So having to make that extra step of when I'm reading a description of something and they're talking about publications, that I can translate that in my head that it could mean also exhibitions. Mm -hmm. Okay, why don't we open it up um, if anybody has any questions or thoughts about intersections of art and science and uh, what that interdisciplinary frontier might. Yeah, so uh, uh, Raphael and I will take questions and I'll start. Yeah, thank you for being here. Um, great topics. Um, what relationship do you see between um, animal creations and their what phenotypes and human art? Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, for me, that was an interesting, interesting thing that I got out of this collaboration because um, I left off my section of, of I was really interested in taking this object, this animal created object that's often sort of aesthetically appreciated as and labeled as art and sometimes even sold as art and displayed as art. And um, taking that in from, from just an aesthetic thing that's in nature to something that uh, an artist might incorporate into their particular output. And it was, I thought it was really interesting in that, that it ended up taking this, this object and kind of exploding it and making the point no longer based in the object, but sort of in, in the process of, of making the, the object and the space in which it inhabited, which we chose for it to inhabit. So I think it, it sort of made it less aesthetically, it, it, it sort of blew up the aesthetics of the actual object and turned it into something beyond the object. Um, and I think it, that's when it transitioned from the realm of this, we're displaying an animal created object to this is an art piece. Um, 
when humans create art, when, when we create things, it's, it's, it's an expression of who we are. Is there, do you see a relationship between that and what animals naturally do? Like w another question I wanted to ask was, are there uh, mathematical equations or formulas that, that describe, you know, like um, uh, golden ratio or Fibonacci sequence or something that, that describes how animals create? And then if, if we're over here creating on our own, is, is there a direct relationship, you know, from the animal in us and what animals do? Do we do things similarly in, in some way? Yeah. So, uh, like, are you asking if you can look at look at an animal created object in this case, in this case, a nest nest architecture, and then learn something about the creator, learn something about the animal itself? Yeah. So, um, fu so functionality is is a major thing in in objects like this, um, and. It is, like I said, they are a product of natural selection, and there is functionality built into it, built into the actual arrangement of space. Um, so the particular, for, for instance, in, in these nests, uh, some of these chambers are used to store seeds. Some of them are used to raise young. Um, and some of them are multifunctional. Um, and this, the size of the chamber determines the amount of individuals that can be in that chamber doing work. So that's a product of the optimal group size for this particular species for doing some task, whether or not it's raising young or something like that. So the actual size of the area and the size that they create is an extension of, of some, some sort of ideal efficiency of them for performing some sort of task. Um, so, so that kind of speaks more from the design front, right? But I, I will say this f firstly. Humans are also animals. So that, that right there kind of points to the answer of, of course, we have similarities. We're, we're not plants. We're not mineral. We're also animals. So even just compulsions, like I'm curious about if ants are doing movements in that space or making decisions about how to construct that space that they're not aware of. It's not conscious. And I wouldn't say it, it wouldn't fall under involuntary, but it's just compulsion. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of artists probably relate to and probably scientists too. Um, there's this funny thing where for, for art objects, you have to move it into an art space and you have to qualify it to, in order to be art. And coming from a fiber background and being an educator in fiber art, we're constantly talking about why is grandma's quilt not an art piece, but then this other thing is. We constantly have to talk about uh, what role does labor play into perceived value. It, so much of it these days in the art world just comes down to context, and you just have to back up your argument. It's really interesting. Um, and there are lots of out, what, what people call outsider artists that are working really hard and doing wonderful work that nobody knows about and may never know about, which is interesting because it's just like everything we walk by underneath the sidewalk every day, right? Lots of work going on. Maybe it's compulsive. Um, there, I'm sure there's definitely math involved. I'm personally, I'm really interested in the negative space. I want, I want to be able to spend a lot more time with this, and work with the negative space in the ant nests. Thank you. It's a great talk. Uh, I tend to associate woven materials, knitted crochet, with patterns and symmetry and stuff like that. And you have gone sort of the opposite direction on that. You know, you've ex explicitly exposed different areas to different tensions when normally you would try and even out that tension so as not to uh, stress yeah. the fabric. Yeah. I'm, I'm usually just responding to space with my installations. As you, you saw, there are po points where I'll be more consistent and draw lines pretty consistently, like for plotting those glass pieces in space. Um, this one's just the ca what I call chaotic. So I'm really just responding to the forms that I'm suspending and then the space around them. Um, but that's a great insight about pattern. What else was I going to say about that? I mean, it's really about tension for me. And it, I think that that that's becomes an aesthetic decision for myself. Like. The, the repeated forms in this case are the little tubes that I had to cut up so that I would have them able to repeat, you know? Um, so there is repetition in there, but it's, it is a lot more subtle on this piece. 
Um, yeah, and then as far as consistency goes, it just, it doesn't need it physically and, and aesthetically I made that decision. I can, I will focus certain lines, like if I, if I really love like a certain branch movement of one of these strands, I can emphasize that by wrapping more together. Um, and typically I'm just working with tension. I don't, I don't really like slack. So I'll, I'll build up tension and it all kind of, it's wonderful because it really unifies. As I move through, they become less individual strands and more a solid sheet or a solid sphere even, whatever it is that I'm, as they interweave. Are there critical areas where if this line snaps, it's all sort of gonna fall apart? Perfect question, all of it. <laughs> Come on, co come on up and please be careful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We've I've been dealing with this for a couple months in the lab. Dealing, <laughs> dealing with it. Yeah. <laughs> it's very dangerous to walk in my lab right now. Yeah. Oh. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Speaking of tension. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but no, to follow up on what he was talking about, um, just kind of to further that discussion. Like, I, I think what you were kind of wondering is do animals create art for aesthetic purposes? Like, or is there any personality unique to individual animals with their structures or, you know, not like, or is it all evolutionarily driven or for a function or as you were saying? But I'm, what I was thinking of when, other than like the nests where there's clearly a, a function and things have to be a certain way, but like the animals that build nests that have to be aesthetically appealing to attract a mate, like bowerbirds, like those uh, big circles made by the pufferfish that they didn't know what was making them for years. There's not really a direct connection between some fitness of the of the animal building the nest. It's almost as though the the mate is judging it just based on the aesthetics. So in that way, kind of, there's maybe a more direct connection with an animal making quote unquote art. Um, yeah, all that ti is tied to like sexual selection and mate selection in in organisms, and that's one area of, of ants that hasn't really been studied that much. There's we don't really study s a lot of people don't study sexual selection in ants because ant mating is mysterious and happens in the air once a year, uh, and you can't really replicate it. It's true, true thing. Uh, you can't really replicate it in the lab. Uh, I don't have any ants mating in, in my lab. It's very hard to do. There's only a couple species that do it. So yeah, a lot of that gets neglected in my particular area of research. Yeah. But yeah, you're right, that sexual selection does drive for ornamentation and, and decoration and of things. And you like a dance or something might prove some physical prowess that might benefit the offspring, but designing a nest is just gonna maybe benefit the ability of the offspring to design a nest later, you know? Right, yeah. and there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a thing in, in sexual selection called the handicap principle just sort of runaway selection on on ornamentation that's almost a detriment to the individual. So it's, you know, a, a peacock's long feather prevents it from flying and escaping predators, but it lets it, it's more attractive to mates. Um, so it's handicapped by that thing. Um, it's a really interesting area of sexual selection, ornamentation and stuff like that in animals. Unfortunately, a lot of that doesn't happen in ants. <laughs> But a lot of cool stuff happens in ants. Don't get down on ants. Um, you spoke a little bit to sort of resolving the conflict between representing something sort of true form and abstracting it uh, in an artistic way. Um, do you think that there's a conflict in the context of having this in a science museum, a conflict between sort of having something that's accessible and appealing to look at and being informative and representing something's true form. Did, did you, we, we definitely were talking about that. Um, and then we have like, just for instance, making sure that there's a sign that th says that this is art, <laughs> right? In the middle of a science museum, um, so that people aren't thinking that it's, that we have these new golden orb spiders that are collaborating with the ants making, <laughs> that make this polyester yarn, it, yeah. Um, but you yeah, I think a cool part of it is 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 you can see right through the piece of art, and actually right behind it is a metal cast that is left intact. And then if you walk around the corner, um, there's a, just a straight up a, like exhibit display in my lab of an intact uh, ant nest that has all the things you'd expect from 
uh, museum exhibit display about nest architecture. It has a, tons of information about the ants that made it. Um, so for me, it's a cool juxtaposition that on one side of the lab, you can look through and you can see this uh, blown up piece of nest architecture in the context of an art display. And then you can walk around the corner and look in the lab from a different perspective and you'll be looking right at uh, a straight up museum exhibit display of an intact ant nest art nest architecture piece. Um, so for me, I like having those two things on display because um, I think that's a, that's a unique thing that a museum like this offers uh, and that can present is that these glass walled labs provide a lot, of, a lot of area to look through and a lot of different perspectives into science, both physically and, and metaphorically. And I feel like putting a piece of art in there too adds to that overall idea of what this you know, city museum was invested in and wanted to show when it was made like five years ago. I will say it, it is interesting to have an art piece. Uh, for me, for my career, having it in um, a science museum, I've had my work in a lot of different places, as you've seen, a lot of places that are falling apart, and that's part of it. Um, but for, for me especially, like this collaboration has been like multifaceted. It's really about me going out and doing some of the science work where we're digging out this next nest and we're, we're casting it. Um, and then observing the, the ants, um, and then pulling all of it together, having these conversations about what we're doing uh, with our research side by side. Um, it's, it's got more levels to it overall for me. I see the project as having, it's not just this object or this one thing. So this is, this is different from anything else that I've done in that, in that sense, that it's not just, okay, I did the thing, I made it, that's it. That's, that's not it, that's a part of much of it, a lot more. All right. I have a technical question <coughs> for Adrian, I guess. Um, <coughs> it's two, two part. How do you know you got the whole nest? Mm -hmm. And um, are there ways to image so that you don't have to do the, the casting? Um, w we know we have the whole nest because uh, when the material freezes, uh, if it's metal, um, it, it's a, it'll freeze and, and there'll be a smooth sort of nub at the end. If it stopped because it hit soil, uh, you can see the, the outline of the soil in it. So it, in, in metal casting, um, you can dig the whole thing out in, in basically one piece. And if you see like a frozen nub of an end, you know you didn't get a complete cast. Um, and you know that the hole probably still goes. Um, but if you reach if you reach the bottom of the cast and it dead end and it looked like it hit soil, then that's a pretty good indication you got it all. Um, and, and the same thing is true sort of for a, a more dental plaster uh, based nest or a plaster based nest. Because at the end you'll get, um, sort of the straw effect where you'll just be a, a hollow cast of a tube where there wasn't enough material to actually hit the bottom and then fill back up. Mm -hmm. So you'll start getting hollow tubes at the end and then it's a pretty good indication that you probably didn't get the whole thing. Um, you can see some of the hollow tubes at the end of this nest uh, if you look at it upstairs. Um, and then the second question was about imaging the nest without uh, casting it. Right, right. Um, that's a little bit harder to do, uh, but you, we, you can uh, excavate, like the picture I showed of me as a teenager in a giant pit, um, you can excavate layer by layer and then do tracings oh. of the nest. So that's, that's one way that we'll do it if we want to collect everything that's in a nest, is we'll dig a giant pit next to the nest and go at it layer by layer and be, just be there with a vacuum basically, sucking up the ants as they appear. And you can outline and take a census of the entire nest architecture, um, but you can't. Um, and then you can reconstruct it digitally afterwards, um, but you won't have the actual piece. You can't see it in form uh, really that way. And, and I had a completely different question, one for both of you. <coughs> it's the same question, but um, as a scientist, where's the beauty here? And as an artist, where's the beauty here? Uh, well, for me, it was, I, I do agree that, that a nest architecture produces aesthetically pleasing and interesting things to look at. So there's beauty there. But for me, this process revealed that there's beauty in the process of both art and science. Um, and there's beauty in the connections between those two things. And I think that was the unexplored territory uh, that we took it in, that it wouldn't normally uh, be taken. Normally, 
um, the ways I've seen it is it stops at the aesthetics, it stops at the object. Um, and I, I like that this project ended up not about the object anymore. It's about everything around the object. And I think that's symbolic in the piece upstairs in that we deconstructed the object. It's not about the object, it's about the space around the object. It's about the space that you can look through the object and see in the lab. It's about everything about that. I think that was the, the cool part for me. I, I definitely agree about the process um, being beautiful and being able to have the, the uh, interdisciplinary discussion was just, it was wonderful, especially as an educator and just somebody that likes to learn. It's so important that we keep learning. Um, I obviously, as you saw with most of my slides, I have an interesting relationship with beauty um, as an artist. So that's not necessarily something that I can I might not even have an answer for you on that one. Um, beauty is challenging and frustrating and is completely, um, I mean, I don't want to say relative, but you know, I think for me, I don't, I don't think of what, I don't think of what I do as, as beautiful. Like when I have a successful moment in my work, it just feels good and it feels right. So it's, it might speak to like my own compulsion and my own whatever's going on in my brain um, as, this entity um, that I just feel like I have to do this thing. And so it kind of really comes back to all this thing of why is anybody doing anything? Why are the ants making the forms that they're making? There's a lot we don't know, but I think, you know, studying brain work would be good <laughs> for, for us and for other species. And um, there's, there's a lot we don't understand and that's fascinating. I, that's where I have a great time. And that's the beauty to me is just learning and dig in more. We have time for one more question and then we'll go upstairs. How does dental plaster differ from plaster of Paris? Uh, it's harder uh, once it cures. And um, uh, we, I actually use, we, so you, we use dental plaster to study the nest architecture, but also we construct the lab nest that the ants actually live in because um, it's really good for a uh, re-wetting and still remaining hard so the ants can't dig through it, but it will hold moisture so that the ne actually lab nests that they live in up upstairs are all made out of dental plaster also. Yeah, it's a really uh, useful material for studying ants, it turns out. Okay, a question about the material that you use because I can't quite tell what it is, whether you use dental floss or, or, or are you just twisting other things together. I'm curious, do you ever use wool? And in that respect, I have a, a second question to go with because you know, you can make you, you most wool, when people are spinning it, they, spill, they spin from carded wool, yeah. which is very smooth and has no lumps or anything. Uh, my friend spins directly from locks, which makes a wonderful type of, of um, uh, wool with, with lots of lumps in it. Yeah. And so my question is, would you ever use anything like that? I have, but not really for installation. Um, I also, I've, I did a residency on the muskox farm who they, those animals have a special fiber called kivute that has these really amazing properties if you compare it to wool. And I've worked with wool a lot. I love wool. I grew up hating wool until I worked with it and realized how special it really is. It's pretty magical and it, it's really forgiving and um, it manages smells, so that's nice to wear. It's, it's just great. Um, I, this, is, this is a nylon polyester, some kind of polymer that I have that I usually, pretty much everything I work with is found, it's in, a lot of it is like industrial surplus or post-consumer stuff pre or post consumer, I, it's just stuff that society doesn't want anymore. And then I just work with it. Um, the polymers have been great for this because they're a little bit more reliable as far as stretch goes. Um, but I've done a lot of spinning with, with wool and I, I teach it all the time because I think it's important to be spinning. Um, I'll just say this is like my last, my last thing on all that. I'm into fibers because I think it's the foundation of the physical universe. Um, Spinning itself is, is locking everything in, locking things together with potential energy. So you just freeze something with potential energy, and then you keep building from there with more and more tension, which is potential energy. So that's what I'm really fascinated with, and there, I think there's a lot more to go into on that with physics, too. 
Okay, so that concludes the discussion part of our evening, but there's still the very exciting option of heading up to Adrian's lab on the third floor and getting to see the piece in person. And if you have more questions, these guys will be up there to answer them. And remember, next week, Thursday night, is Thanksgiving, so no cafe, but we'll see you back the week after that. And thank you so much. Good night.